Okay, webinar is now being recorded. So it is with pleasure tonight I get to introduce Renee Murphy. The title of her presentation is going to be Reclaiming Nature, the Role of Native Plants in Backyard Biodiversity Restoration. Renee is an environmental scientist and a director of sales for Intrex Environmental. Renee has a master's in plant science and agriculture from Cal Poly Paloma and a bachelor's in business from University of Southern California. Renee incorporates her native plant knowledge and agronomic background, developing nature-based sustainable solutions for contamination and drought impacted sites using endophyte assisted phytotechnology. This is really cool stuff. Renee has served as a project manager on sites that focus with ecological restoration, establishing native plants on exposed playa at the Salton Sea, and other drought and fire impacted sites. Um, as an educator of nature-based solutions, Renee has presented to NASA Ames Green Team, Sustainable Silicon Valley, Alaska Forum for the Environment, National Brownfields Training Conference, and has an international keynote speaker at NICOLA Org 2020, Resiliency, Nature, and Climate Solutions in South Africa. Renee really knows her stuff. <laughs> Previously the director of sales for a large native plant nursery, Renee serves her community through outreach programs as a speaker and workshop instructor for the California Native Plant Society, teaching native plant propagation and seed collecting. Renee, Renee's hope is to inspire people to be positive change in their community and starting with that change in their own backyard. So it's my pleasure tonight to present to you Renee Murphy. Renee. Hey everybody, um, good evening. I'm really excited to be talking to all of you. I'm actually uh, living in Southern California right now and I um, had been there for 25 years but spent two awesome years up in uh, Northern California area and um, got to meet people from the Sac Valley chapter and uh, teach propagation classes um, in person as well, which was really cool. Um, but I do have a pretty diverse background in restoration and uh, uh, native plant sales working at um, a nursery directly and now getting to actually incorporate that in uh, restoration work and working on contaminated sites. Um, so I put a presentation together really showing you how I, I think one of the problems that we have as people is it's very easy to um, become defeated and feel like there isn't something that we can do. Um, to help all the problems that we see out there in the environment. Um, and you really can, as one single individual, make a, a, a big change in your community, just starting with your own backyard. So I put together a presentation based um, upon that idea. So with that, I'll go ahead and share screen with you. Okay. All right, so is everybody just seeing my main screen and not my notes? We are. Awesome, thank you. So um, talking about bringing native plants into our landscaping, this is such an incredible opportunity for us to really be able to increase biodiversity. This is such a, a positive way that you could make change. And the beautiful part about this is this is in your own backyard. And just by changing what you do in your front yard or even your backyard landscaping, you will have a significant impact on the environment around you. So let's just go back to the beginning what are native plants and why are they so important? And I mean, we can look at this picture here of Joshua tree um, and, and I'm sure everybody recognizes the Joshua tree, Yucca brevifolia. It's really an iconic tree. However, what makes this so incredible about this particular area uh, in the, the desert out here in Southern California is that Joshua trees are a host to only two Yucca moths. And these moths lay their eggs uh, within the Joshua tree flowers and nowhere else. So these Joshua trees in turn um, completely rely on these two moths for their pollination. 
So out in the Mojave Desert, these yucca moths are solely responsible for the pollination of these trees. So if you can just consider what would happen if these trees disappeared? What would happen to these species of moths? And then again, on the flip side of that, what would happen if the moths disappeared? How would these trees get pollinated? You know, um, I think one thing that we're not understanding is what we're, what we're trying to increase biodiversity is really increasing the insect life in an area by increasing the insect life and providing these host plants for insects. We're then increasing the animals that will feed off of those insects. So if you think about it, we're starting really from scratch. We're starting with those insects. You know, um, I've heard people say, well, you know, uh, plant species or insect species, they'll adjust to, to the loss of uh, biodiversity and their habitat. And that actually isn't what happens. What happens is these species actually um, decrease um, in the amount of uh, species that are available. So they just in, in, instinctually will stop breeding as much or will just go somewhere else to find the habitat that they need. Um, you know, an, an example of this is that 13,000 years ago, there actually used to be a ground sloth that was another one of the Joshua tree pollinators. And obviously, uh, if you've been to Joshua tree, you know there are no more ground sloths um, out there in the desert. So that was a pollinator um, that we lost. And so you can understand how slowly evolution happens. So if we just remove a species or it's no longer there, we're really putting these other um, uh, species that are relying on on different plants to be there. Uh, we're really put, putting them at a loss. And I see someone asked a question. So I'm just gonna take a look. Okay, maybe not. So native plants are these species that he, have evolved over a long period of time in a specific region. And they've adapted to that local climate, the soil and the wildlife. So they are the perfect plant species to be located in that area. Um, and I'll tell you what was a really frustrating thing for me. I, I uh, recently had been to South Africa and I was taking this amazing hike and I noticed that everything on that hike looked like everything that I see at Home Depot. And I was like, how, how is this happening? Why are, why do I recognize all of these plants? And, you know, there was just this realization that everything we have access to buy at our big box stores are not California native plants. They are not the plants that are supposed to be planted in our yards out here. They are plants from all over the world that are brought here by our horticultural industry. And so that is not only with the development, but it's really with our horticulture industry that there really is this uh, problem that continues to repeat. So you can see by this next slide, we all are very aware, aware of um, this species that has been suffering um, over the past years of um, the lack of having habitat for, uh, for specifically to the monarch um, butterfly. Um, so you can see how uh, there are species that need certain habitat. And without that, we will actually see a reduction in this habitat. So let's talk a little bit more about this biodiversity. So why is this biodiversity so important to California? And if you look at this map, you can see, and I'm sorry, it's not the um, most clear map, but you can see all of the concentration of colors over the California area. It's because California is a biodiversity hotspot looking across the United States. So our Sierra Nevada mountains, our California coastal ranges, um, all the way through our Cal California Channel Islands. So as people living in the state of California, we really have a responsibility to help fix this problem that's happening globally. Um, and, you know, specifically to California, it's our amphibians and our plants and our bird species. So, um, you know, keep that in mind. And, and one thing I find that most people are not aware of the fact that this biodiversity is truly shrinking and it is truly a global problem. But being in uh, the um, remediation industry and the restoration industry, it really is a big problem. And it's something that we educate uh, clients every day when they come to us. And, uh, and although we are seeing more and more people being more educated about this, 
it does feel like my every day, I'm starting with from scratch a lot of times with people and explaining to them the importance of incorporating the, this type of landscape into um, these major rehabilitation efforts. So I think this is a really good visualization of what happens with the species loss when we develop and then additionally not just to develop, but when we go in and we plant our landscaping with uh, non-native um, and really a different aesthetic from what belongs here in California. Um, if you could see the very bottom image of just the very clean lawn landscaping, how many insects that landscaping supports compared to when you add more flowers and more shrubs. And then ultimately when you add the in, in, entire collection of you know, ecological plants um, to, to really create um, it, the full picture there and seeing how many different species uh, a yard like that would support. You know, native plants, they provide food and shelter for local wildlife, from bees to butterflies, birds, to small mammals. And by planting these native plants in our yard, we are really creating stepping stones for these species to survive. So if you could imagine we can uh, create specific areas that we're setting aside. For example, we set aside Joshua Tree Park and, and we have that as the specific place to where uh, those species will be. That's really not good enough. What that does it and what that creates when we are um, over developing different areas and not creating ways for our uh, insects and our birds and mammals to be able to kind of come together, it does create these areas of where there's, uh, where there's, there, there's these deserts. And so they're not connected. And that becomes a problem too. Hold on. Is someone trying to come into the room? Okay, I, I'm going to need you to come back. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Family coming into the room. Okay, so let's talk about this biodiversity. This is really the key to having a healthy thriving ecosystem. And it's these varieties of these different plants, animals, insects, and microorganisms that work together to maintain this ecological balance. And unfortunately, as I uh, spoke about before, the urbanization and the habitat lo lo loss has led to this decline in biodiversity. But here's the good news. If we can all as homeowners come together and our backyards become these kind of mini refuges for native species, we really can make a difference. What we're really creating is this connectivity between our yards and landscaping. So there's you know, this risk of just focusing on these protected areas, we just get these little islands of biodiversity, then that's nice, but ultimately it isn't the solution to the problem. So the best thing that we can do is if you just start in your own yard and start creating this atmosphere of these native plants, I promise you that your native, your neighbors will start coming over, showing interest in what it is that you're doing. And ultimately there is that opportunity for you to, show your enthusiasm about what you're doing for your yard and what you're doing for the different um, plants, uh, different animal and insect species, and hopefully um, gently educating all the people in your area who are seeing what you're doing, um, especially if this is in your front yard. So if we're really going to restore things, we need to create that connectivity. So this is a really great opportunity for you to get to know your neighbors and really discuss how these things are important. And hopefully you'll convince all of them to, to really start bringing natives into their yard as well, because you will be creating a much bigger area that branches together this connectivity that we need. So I know we all hear all of these uh, different um, benefits uh, to planting natives. And you know, there are a whole slew of them. And I will tell you, I took a lot of them out of this presentation because you will hear things such as, uh, you know, native, native plants have deeper root systems. Yes, that's true, but in comparison to what? Um, and, and so there is a lot of discussion between what we say about native plants to be true versus what truly is true you can compare some native plants to other species. And yes, they will have a deeper root system. And I think everybody who works with native plants directly will say, yes, they have a very, very deep root system. And the reason for this is that they are deep diving 
um, down to a, a water table or areas of moisture um, because of the climate in California. So yes, they do have deeper root systems. However, there's a lot of argument and discussion about that um, because that doesn't mean that non-native species don't have those deep root roots as well. So I did try and remove some of those things out of this presentation that could be um, argued against per se and scientifically and really just tried to pull out from experience and, and from talking to customers and um, what I have read to really be um, the benefits to native landscaping. Um, and this would be their low ma maintenance aspect, uh, their water conservation or climate resilience of native plants, their aesthetic appeal to an area, in, including keeping an area's heritage. And then in addition to that, improving biodiversity, which we've talked about. So let's talk about this idea of low maintenance. Now, we have an idea of aesthetically what plants should look like, and this is really where we need to be re-educating ourselves to understand what plants are supposed to look like and why they're supposed to look like that. And what I mean by that is imagine this salvia apiana, this white sage plant. During the summer, it puts off these incredible stalks with these beautiful white blooms. Um, then it experiences some summer dormancy. So you'll see what looks like dieback. And uh, ultimately through the winter, it has these big, um, uh, well, ultimately they just look like stakes, right? So if you had a gardener who just did your typical mow and blow, they would go by and prune these dead stems off of the shrub. Now here's where the problem lies is those sticks are actually where our native bees overwinter and insects actually overwinter in those stalks. So if you didn't know that as a homeowner, you would cut those um, stems off and you'd be removing that area that is really important to our native species in order to overwinter. Um, so it, 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 it's a little difficult because it takes us changing aesthetically what we think plants need to look like. And then we start running into the problems with maybe our neighbor doesn't like the way our yard looks um, because maybe they think it looks messy. Um, so again, it's really important that we are gently educating our neighbors as to why we're leaving things a certain way. Um, and that as soon as the spring comes around, we'll, we will trim that back. But for right now, it's really important that it looks the way it does because of the importance to um, the ecology of your yard. Uh, and I think it's extremely important as native enthusiasts that we're very gentle about the way we transmit information to people. Um, I've had a very frustrating experience with different um, na native experts who um, talk to people as if there is no one way to do things and that there's just a right way and a wrong way. And I think that it's really important that we're meeting people where they are. And you may potentially be meeting someone who does not know anything about native plants. Um, and if you're not encouraging to them and, and really getting, getting them excited about learning why it's so important, um, rather than telling them how it should be and possibly turning them off. And I see this on our social media sites as well with um, native plant people. So I just urge you to be really careful um, especially if you really know a lot about native plants is be careful about how you come off to people when, when you are attempting to educate them, that it's very important that you are meeting people where they are. And, and, you know, baby steps ultimately is what we're looking for. Nobody is going to be the perfect native plant yard overnight. And, and, um, we have to be really cognizant of that, understand that it is really, um, it is something that takes a lot of time and a lot of experience um, to really become very educated and very um, good at native gardens. So just, uh, you know, the, just please be careful when, when you're educating people and just lead by your enthusiasm rather than thinking that you are an expert and there is no other way to do things. So, you know, when I talked about uh, about low maintenance. You know, one of the big things about native gardens um, is that they don't require the fertilizer and uh, that you would uh, need when you're looking at um, non-native gardens like 
the easiest one off the top of my head is of course a, a lawn, right? This requires a lot of fertilizer. It requires a lot of herbicide. It requires a lot of water, it requires a lot of maintenance. So really the great benefit of a native plant garden is low maintenance is it really does allow you to be pretty much a lazy gardener, which I have to be admit to, I am that lazy gardener. So um, for me to know that I don't have to put fertilizer onto my plants because these plants have lived here for you know hundreds of thousands of years and and it, it really is um, you know and let, let me back up on that a little bit. I think uh, an important thing to remember too is we are planting plants in order to provide the right um, habitat and provide food for insects and uh, you know, little mammals. And we need to change our idea about thinking that, oh, there's holes in the plant. Um, there's an insect here. I need to remove that insect because it's creating damage on my plant. If you could think of it as more as that you are providing the habitat for the insects and it's really for them. So rather than seeing those holes and imperfections as, as insect damage, um, you can see it in a whole different life light. Like there's a uh, leaf cutter ant that cuts these beautiful circles on, on leaves and it uses it to wrap their larvae up. And it's really so beautiful when you see it and understand it as that versus I have an insect that's just eating up holes all over my leaves. So some things to think about. Um, but I did wanna show you something that I come across uh, in my line of work. Uh, this is agricultural land um, out in the uh, San Joaquin Valley, and it has been farmed conventionally with fertilizer and herbicide for decades. And this is exactly what the soil looks like. It's dead. There's no organic matter, um, and it has a very high salinity level in the soil. Um, really difficult to grow anything in this. So I want you to consider this the next time that you're reaching for miracle Grow, or something that's synthetic. If you don't know about organic fertilizers, if you don't know about the difference between organic versus, you know, your conventional uh, methods of gardening, I, I urge you to, to start learning more about this because ultimately there is no quick fix to anything on this world. And I think we all know that. Um, and when we use things such as miracle grow or synthetic fertilizers, not only are these things produced in facilities that are very dangerous to the environment and pollute the environment terribly, um, but we really are not putting anything back into the soil. And if you look at uh, using compost and these more organic ways of gardening, we are improving the soil every time we use them. And using synthetic fertilizers and herbicides, we are actually deteriorating the health of the soil every time that we use these. And this is just a real world example of what soil looks like that has not been um, cared for in a sustainable way. Um, I'm not saying this is what your yards are gonna look like, but in the grand scheme of things, this is what we are doing. So let's talk about how water conservation uh, for native plants, this is hands down the number one reason why I think you should plant native plants in your yard. And one of the things we are constantly telling, um, you know, customers out in the nurseries and one of the most frustrating things that, that I would experience, especially in the Orange County um, nurseries they would actually tell me that their customers do not care about their water bill and their customers have plenty of money and don't care about their water bills and they're fine with planting whatever they want. And that would was so cringy to me um, because that is so disconnected from people because I know if, uh, uh, there are many, many people in Orange County that uh, would love to reduce their water bill um, and the cost of maintenance of their gardening. So. I just found that to be so um, sad to hear from um, owners of nurseries. And again, meeting them where they're at, trying to explain to them that there are large contingents of people in every county that want these native plants. And if they do carry them, the customers will come. 
Um, and ultimately that is the case. Um, I know a native plant people, we go all over to find the plants that we want. Um, and they, the best thing we could do with nurseries is encourage these mom and pop nurseries and these non big box stores to carry native plant nursery or to carry native plants and to explain to them why and how important it is to be teaching their customers why this is a good idea to carry um, native plants. Uh, but if you can imagine, you know, uh, native plants have uh, learned to live in the desert environment of California, and they do have a period of which they go into summer dormancy. And again, this is one of those times where we need to readjust what we aesthetically think is right for a plant to look like. In the summertime, they're basically shutting themselves off and putting their energy where they need to be, which is in the roots and surviving. And then after the summer goes, they will then rebloom. Um, so I think this is quite an amazing thing that plants do. And again, one of those things that if you're educating your neighbor that, hey, look, this is actually nature's way of just conserving energy and to come back after the summer, it's really quite an amazing thing that this plant is doing versus looking like it's dead. Um, native plants, they require minimal irrigation. Um, you know, a drip line irrigation is sometimes considered best. Again, you'll get arguments back and forth, but I have to be quite honest with you. I lived in a very hot area and my idea of irrigation was if I, if after I a, attempted to establish the plant after about uh, three to six months, I just completely stopped watering because in my opinion, if it's going to live in my yard, it needs to know how to live in my yard without me constantly watering it. Um, so I think that is really important is to make sure that you are planting plants that can tolerate the conditions of your yard so that you really are minimally irrigating. You know, and again, native plants, they're resilient to the climate here in California. They have dealt for thousands of years the different types of client or different types of climate changes that we have. And yes, we are dealing with things um, in, in climate change. We're dealing with all kinds of conditions that you know we really haven't seen for a long time. And that's going to be difficult on any plant. However, when you're looking at natives versus non-natives, uh, your native plants really should fare better and be more resilient to the climate change that that we are experiencing. So I wanted to talk a little bit about our aesthetic appeal. Now, how many of you thought about like, where do I get the ideas of what I think looks good in a landscape? And, you know, when I first um, got my first home and had the ability to landscape for myself, the first thing I wanted to do was automatically put in something that looked like, you know, this European garden, you know, hedges, grass, you know, sculptured look. And this came from obviously coming to the United States, the old world. This was what luxury looked like. So if you created this look in your yard, you had this feeling of affluence. So I think that's why you go to, uh, you know, different five-star resorts, they all have the same looking landscape. You're not, it's only going to be in your, your newer luxury hotels that you're going to see the, the landscape aesthetic look different. And it's really great when you can see one that actually does something that's more in line with what is native. Uh, but again, there's this idea of what we think is aesthetically appealing because we were told in, in certain magazines that this is what is appealing and this is what it should look like. And I think that's where you get that pushback with homeowners associations and, you know, neighbors who think that, you know, a native garden looks too messy um, and looks unkept because it doesn't have this appeal. Um, which again, this was just taught to us because this is what was the prevailing look um, of the times and then passed over to us. So I do challenge you to, to think about that. Think, why do I want um, my landscape to look that way. Um, you know, one of, I, I grew up in Arizona. One of the frustrating things to me um, in Arizona is all the people who will put in a lawn in the middle of the desert. Uh, and I think they, I just read an article that uh, there was an area of Arizona where they were actually uh, making it um, illegal to put in 
um, lawn uh, in a new development, which although I don't like this idea of having to force people to do something, is it really, are we still at this point um, of, of the, the water issues that we have? Are we still putting in lawns when we're moving to the desert? Um, so my thought behind that is again, it's, it's, it's the aesthetics of where we come from. Um, and I see this a lot with, with people like who move from the East coast to the West coast. And the first thing they want to do is put in this luscious, lawn because that's what it looked like where they came from um and you know i think there's something really um really uh, lost in the fact that you know you would go to our our courthouses or our government buildings and the landscaping isn't intentionally designed to look like uh the types of plants that should be in that area to me I want to go to New Mexico and I want the homes and the gardens to look like plants should look in New Mexico. And I want to go to Montana and I want to see that things look like they belong in Montana. It's, it's confusing to me that we don't do a better job of that because there are such beautiful native California plants. And why don't we want to showcase that, especially in our public spaces? So again, just to, some things to think about. There is a, un, a unique and diverse beauty about the local ecosystem. And I wish that we could all embrace that more. And, and again, this thought that there isn't anything that you can do. There really is. If you consider the fact that every one of us work in, whether it's government or education or we work for a landscape company or we work for you know someone in the city we are connected to people that make decisions about how things get landscaped every single day. And we have the ability to educate and discuss these things uh, with people. I mean, I have a friend who works for Caltrans and he is so sick of hearing from me, why do we choose to use uh, mixed seed for the sides of freeways that don't have native plants in them? To me, it's just the funniest thing that we wouldn't just spray California poppy seeds everywhere. And he's like, Renee, I don't have anything to do with the landscaping for Caltrans. Like I test concrete, but you know, in my mind, he might one day meet the person who has something to do with the decision-making on why they do things the way they do. And when he meets that person, he will have all the information that he needs it's from all the times that I bothered him about why it is they're doing it one way where it could possibly be doing, doing it a different way. So just again, another thought to you, we're all out there in the world and we all have the ability to touch somebody and, and, and help change people's opinions um, about native plants and really do good for our environment. So <laughs> this is one of my rants on social media, unfortunately, um, here in this picture of the plastic, plastic lawn. And again, you could see they're trying to recreate that sort of European look by completely eliminating everything from their yard, except for plastic and stone. And, and uh, the picture's cut off here, but they have two, two plants and a couple of Italian cypress, but their entire front yard is all plastic grass. Um, how how many insects, um, how many small mammals are running through this yard on a daily basis? This is so sad to me. And, and, and again, I'm coming from a place where at one point in my life, I had a small patch of plastic lawn and I didn't, I had no idea what, I, I, I didn't want ants to be in that area, which saddens me to think that I did that. Um, but adding microplastics to our yards is just like one of the worst things that we could do. This plastic also off gases and it's toxic and we have our kids playing on it and we have our pets playing on it. And it's just sad to me that people don't know this about this. We're learning all the dangers of these mi microplastics and how we're finding it in our bodies, in our uh, bloodstream, in our waterways. Um, and this again is, is toxic every single day. Um, so again, if you, 
ever know anybody who's considering putting him in a plastic, uh, putting in plastic wands, please explain to him. It's, it's not just the biodiversity, but this truly is a toxic choice um, that they're adding to their landscaping. You know, I think one of the big issues with native plants is accessibility. And I am not trying to shed the Home Depot in a bad light by any means. I go there and I buy things there all the time. But one thing I do not buy there are their plants. And why don't I buy their plants there? Because there isn't anything in Home Depot that is native, unfortunately. Um, and what saddens me even more is they have a collection of plants called Climate Smart, of which they charge upwards of almost $20 for a one gallon plant for um, this special pot that they say these are, uh, you know, water wise and drought tolerant. Well, hey, I bet everybody in the audience knows all kinds of drought tolerant and water wise plants that are native to California, right? but they're never going to be sold in Home Depot because of the horticultural industry. So this really is a losing battle for us as homeowners. And unfortunately, some people only have access to Home Depot, um, which, which is sad. Um, I did one time see poppies sold for a very short period of time during the summer in a pot. Um, but the only way we are going to be able to change this um, is by going out of our way to shop at our mom and pop nurseries that are not chains and that have native plants. And again, telling them that we want native plants and supporting um, our native plants. There are so many groups that you can join locally to propagate your native plants. If you are on the California Native Facebook propagation group, uh, you know, you could reach out, to, you could put out a message that says, hey, I'm in Sacramento. It, is anybody, is anybody okay with me coming over to take cuttings of uh, their salvia apiana? I guarantee there's someone out there who will say, I do, come on over, I'll give you some cuttings. Through our communities in the native plant community, we can get access to cutting materials for propagation and to grow plants ourselves. I know plants are expensive, but there are ways around this. Um, and hopefully we can get around the fact that most of our access is at these big box stores and not necessarily at our, our small mom and pop uh, native nurseries, although we're getting more and more of them all the time. So yay for all those people who have plans to start nurseries. And there's a lot of people out there who that is what they consider their dream. And I think that's really fantastic. So let's talk about things that you would want to consider if you are going to create a new native landscape. There are some things that you want to make sure that you're doing. Number one, research. Number two, design. Number three, planting. And number four, maintenance. Uh, one of the things I, come, I would come across with people is when they choose plants for their garden, they're literally just going to a, a garden store and just grabbing something that's flowering at the moment and taking that home and putting that in their garden. So it really does take an effort to educate people to do that a little differently specifically when you're dealing with native plants. So what I mean by research is that you want to identify the native plants that are uh, that thrive in your area. And I'm sure every single person who's listening to this webinar knows they can go to calscape.org and type in their area code and get exactly what's supposed to be growing in their area. It's such a wonderful resource. All the states do not have this type of resource, so please take advantage. And I was just uh, uh, messing around and found this. They have a great Bay Area garden planner. They didn't have one specific to Sacramento, but they did have one for the Bay Area. So I thought that was kind of cool. But all of the information is out there, even you know design plans for, for landscapes. So I think most of your time really should be spent in the research area is identifying the plants that thrive in your area. And then the big thing is to study the factors that you have. So what I mean by that is you need to go out into your yard and you need to figure out how much sunlight do you have for how long, what is your soil type and what is your water availability? Be very cl clear about these things. I would have customers who would come getting ready to buy all kinds of plants wholesale at a nursery. And then I would ask them, does your yard have a lot high sun? Are there shade areas? Is it, you know, half sun, half shade? what's your soil type, uh, how do you plan to irrigate? And um, they would look at me stunned, like those weren't even questions that they considered. 
And what we would do is send them home without plants and say, you need to figure these things out. So take a day or two and look at these conditions and, and do a little bit of research, understand what different soil types mean so that you're really buying plants that will thrive in your area and that you're also buying plants that will meet, match the type of gardener that you are. Uh, so I wouldn't be uh, invest. Uh, let me give you an example of that. I had a customer one time who says, I want to plant this plant, but I'm afraid it's going to get too big and it's next to my pool equipment. And I said, well, we know this is going to get to be substantial. Um, they said, well, I want to plant it near the pool equipment. Well, why are you creating work for yourself? You're going to have to go out there and prune that shrub all the time in order to keep it in line with being next to pool equipment. So by studying what you need in your yard, also consider the area of space that you need for your plants and don't create problems for yourself because you want to plant something in an area it really doesn't belong. So I like this picture, even though it's not all native plants, but the reason I like this picture is because there are some important things you can consider when you're designing your landscape. And if you do have an aesthetic where you really do like more of that traditional aesthetic where they're, you, you know, again, some people think native plants look messy because there's maybe too much going on or too much variety. You don't have to plant that way. You can plant in more of a monochromatic way where you uh, are planting several of the same shrubs, several of the same ground cover, so that it does have this cleaner look to it. Um, and then of course, having trails run through the area. Um, when I was uh, taking uh, courses in horticulture, when we uh, planned displays, we would always have thrillers, which was the top plant, uh, fillers, which were your medium plant, and then spillers, which would spill over. Uh, and this very much, uh, it relates to exactly the way I teach people how to design a native plant landscaping when they're looking at what grows in their area is that you need to have your thriller, which are your trees. So you do need to have something that's going to be large and more the focal point of your yard. You're going to need to have your fillers, which are your shrubs, your middle, your mid range plants. And then you're gonna need, don't forget, you need your ground cover um, because if you don't put something there, if you're not mulching or you don't put a plant there, mother nature will put something there. And unfortunately it'll be something that you call a weed. So consider what you might use for ground cover as well. And you need those three elements to create that, uh, that ecosystem in your yard. Um, and ultimately when you're designing your yard, consider what you are going to do in your yard. Are you gonna create spaces that you want to go out and be in the environment? Or I would wanna uh, have places that, you know, this is where I like to go sit and have my coffee and watch the hummingbirds come into my yard. And over in this part of my yard is more my utilitarian, utilitarian area where I'm gonna be uh, uh, potting my plants and such. So a very important part of the design is how you are gonna use the space. Where are you going to spend the time with your grandkids? Um, where are you going to read your book? And if you can kind of figure out where those zones are going to be in your yard, you're really designing spaces like you design spaces in your house um, versus just putting plants out there because you need to put plants out there. It's really a, a, a bigger deal than that, I think, and something much more special. And if you do consider those elements when you're designing your yard, you will create a space that really is your special environment. Okay, so when we're planting, you wanna choose the right plants for the right area of your yard. And again, you're gonna group similar plants that have that same similar need. So if you have uh, you know, rocky uh, succulents, um, that's a great place to put them in in, in, in uh, maybe your bioswale where you're going to uh, have water, but most of the time it's going to be dry and rocky. Well, you're going to want to put plants that are going to thrive in that area all together. This is how you're going to be very efficient in the way you're caring for your plants. And again, another big thing is plan for the size of these plants. They will be very slow the first year and, you know, uh, 
uh, there's a saying, the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, the third year they leap. Well, I like to think that natives really leap about the two and a half year mark. So be patient, but really there will be an explosion of growth when um, after year two. You know, again, ultimately the maintenance for native plants, there are ideally should not be any fertilizers. You shouldn't need to be using any pesticides or herbicides. I think one of the best things that you can do if this is really important to you and you want to do a nice native plant landscaping in your front yard is get one of these great signs. Um, they really um, will call attention to what you're doing and hopefully, uh, you know, if you've got any of those Karens in your yard who are going to, and no offense to anyone named Karen, but if you're going to have someone coming over and, and not liking what you're doing, again, having these, these signs that help um, describe what's going on, I think, um, opens the conversation up to people. Um, you know, uh, again, low, uh, low maintenance, um, you're going to do some periodic care, but again, you really want to know when you're doing that. Uh, periodic care because you want to make sure that you're not taking away from the insects who need certain parts of the plants for overwintering. Um, ultimately, having a sign like this in your yard really will inspire positive change within your community. You know, by transforming our backyards into native plant sanctuaries, we're taking an active role in conservation. We're increasing the biodiversity and we're also preserving that delicate balance of our local ecosystem. So just imagine what that ripple effect, if we all had this collective effort to contribute to this network of connected habitats across our neighborhood, it just makes me so excited just thinking about it. But if we incorporate our native plants into our backyard landscaping, it's just not all about aesthetics. It is really this powerful step to creating this healthier environment for ourselves. Um, and, and I'm sure uh, most of you out there are already gardeners already and understand that our garden our gardens give back to us so much more than we give to our gardens. Um, I met the most incredible woman when I was working at this native plant nursery and I was delivering her a plant. And I will tell you, I was so grouchy that I had to drive to her specifically to give her this plant um, after I had driven in traffic in San Diego all day long look, uh, visiting accounts. But when I got to her, her home, she was this lovely um, Indian woman and she had had me take off my shoes. And uh, we prayed at uh, the beginning of the garden. And then she brought me in to show her, uh, she gave me a tour of the garden and it was so beautiful in how thoughtfully she placed every plant in that yard and every plant had a specific meaning and a specific reminder. Uh, and sometimes they uh, aesthetically went really well with the, the statue she had. Um, but when I left her garden, I felt the sense of peace and um, I've never forgotten that experience. Sorry, tears up when I think about it. Um, she created this um, paradise for herself, but she said, "I'm giving back to, I'm giving back to the earth that has always given to me." So I think if we all looked at just our space as something as special as the way this woman looked at her yard we would these, be these incredible stewards of biodiversity and we really would leave a lasting legacy for generations to come in however aspect that we do touch people. Um, you know, we all don't have backyards. Um, you don't need to have a backyard. You can start in your community. You could start in your backyard. You could start in, you know, uh, anywhere in the environment by working in restoration uh, you can volunteer to pull weeds. You could go sell at your native plant sale. Every time you get out there and, you know, sort of spread the word of native plants and how this helps this, how, how it helps the environment, it is this call to action that I'm asking for you to do. 
Um, and this is a picture of the Sac Valley CMPS propagation workshop class that we did in um, Sacramento. But this is something that I ask from every one of um, my classes is that they write on this chalkboard their call to action. And it doesn't matter how little or how big it is, but the idea is it's sort of a visual representation of what they're going to carry forward. And I love to know that these are like little pebbles people are throwing in the lake and that ultimately it's gonna cause a ripple effect um, and you don't know what that effect's going to be or how you're going to affect people, but it really is possible to affect everybody in your world by just changing the environment around you. Um, so I just want to inspire you to go out and do that. Um, here's my contact information. If you want to contact me, I teach propagation classes uh, through the CMPS and um, individually as well. And if you want to get on my email list, please shoot me an email, Renee P. Murphy at iCloud, and I'll put you on my mailing list when I have classes in the spring. And on this Linktree link, I try to keep all of my talks and my classes listed there that are up and coming. Um, I'm on Instagram and LinkedIn. Please reach out to me and connect to me if you find any of this interesting and, and want to stay connected. Um, I do answer everybody's email um, that they send to me. Um, and I think that's it. So thank you, everybody. I hope I inspire you to, to uh, change your environment in some way. Thank you so much for your presentation tonight, Renee. That was so inspiring. I absolutely learned um, quite a bit. I was unaware that there were only two moths that pollinated the Joshua tree. Um, I do have a couple of questions in, in the Q&A. Um, uh, one person has asked, are flowers enough or should people be planting shrubs and trees too? And I think you might have answered this with your thrillers, fillers, and, yeah. and fillers, <laughs> which I love trees being identified as a thriller. Um, so do you, um, really it, it's important to plant not just an herbaceous layer but also so consider trees and shrubs and the habitat that those provide for for promoting biodiversity i think you're absolutely right um i think if you can have all three you should have all three and you know trees are so incredibly important in in uh the whole ecological system and i think i'm still sharing screen with you guys i can't figure out how to stop sharing screen i don't know if you can uh, I think I can stop that for you. So I'll, I'll go ahead and actually, um, just actually, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure. Let's, um, I since you we've can leave got it just a couple leave. minutes, I, um, I need to make one correction. I misspoke at the beginning of, of the meeting. The plant sale is on Saturday, September 16th. I think I said Sunday, but Saturday. So please come out to the nursery Saturday. I'd hate for you to show up a, a day late and, Feel so bad. Um, okay, moving through the questions there, how can non-homeowners create native plant habitat? A, a, yes, well, I, I'm in a rental. Um, and I also, when I moved to Northern California for two years, I tried to create it in pots on my patio. Um, I will tell you, I didn't have a tremendous amount of success because I didn't have a lot of uh, good solid sun going on my patio, but I did learn a lot of plants that you can't plant on a patio without sun. So even your failures are ultimately education. Um, I did find a few plants that, that did do pretty well. Um, hummingbird sage for one is a great plant that has an enormously beautiful impact. And the hummingbirds did come to my balcony to indulge themselves. Um, but I will tell you, if you don't have a yard and you know about native plants, please, please, please get out to your local school systems and talk to the kids. The kids are the, they are the solution to everything. You know, if we tell our kids, then they educate their parents and we've got them right from the start. So if you uh, like kids and you can get out there and, and talk to the kids, I promise you, they're not gonna be, they're gonna be okay with you being nervous and they're gonna be okay with you not being perfect. And, and they're just happy that you're there to teach them. You could um, volunteer to be, uh, you know, to work on a school garden. You know, this is the problem is that uh, we don't have people out there volunteering. And I just wonder why. I mean, what are we all doing with our free time? I spend my weekends, uh, you know, teaching um, at the nurseries and teaching classes and 
And when I'm not doing that, you know, I'm, I'm getting involved in some type of restoration effort or just to get out there and, and, and get involved in nature. So you have a lot more time than you think. And there are a lot more opportunities than you think. It just, you, what is it that you like to do or that you're comfortable doing and figure out how can you teach natives in that realm that you're comfortable in? And, and, and again, that is something different to everybody. But I saw people as simple as, uh, you know, I want to teach to my local elementary school all the way to they want to open their own nursery. And, and how you're going to use this information is up to you. But if you don't have a yard, that isn't the only way to do this. You can be doing big efforts by being a volunteer and, and, and helping on different restoration efforts. So, um, yeah, just get involved in any way. And sometimes it might take a while to figure out what your thing is. You know, but what you will do is make a lot of plant, uh, make a lot of plant fronts, which I think we're we're all the same and we're all cut from the same cloth. Um. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, Renee, and I, I I I find your message so so inspiring, and I I, I know that uh, other members of the chapter will um, find this information that you provided tonight in incredibly useful, and um, you know. It, it's one of the things that I really like in your messages. Don't be afraid of, of failure, you know, observe, document and try again. And this really is a whole, whole community. I have one more question and we're over, over eight o'clock tonight. Um, so I'm just going to ask you real quick, if you have any books or literature to recommend for remediation designs, considering our changing climate, that was the last question in the box tonight. Oh gosh. Climate change is a big issue. We've, we're it dealing is, with a lot it, of loss of biodiversity right now. You know, I, I can't say a book specifically. And, you know, I am in that industry right now. And I think the information really is, is actively coming out as we speak. So I think that you really need to read a lot of articles that are being published now. And there's, I have looked for certain information in uh, publications, um, like how can I prove that this is the case for natives? And, you know, there's not as such much information as you would hope, um, but I have to believe it's because we just didn't know this is what we needed to be researching and looking at. And I'm doing a lot of research that's literally being done like as we speak. Um, so I have the opportunity of really getting to go to conferences where I'm seeing a bunch of scientists presenting what it is that they've learned. Um, so I would say go to the CMPS conference. That is a great place to get information. Um, and uh, really, I would say read and read articles and make sure that they're backing it up with some sort of scientific information. There's also a really great book I like, um, uh, Doug, uh, Talamy, I believe. Am I, if I'm mispronouncing it, someone please, please tell me in the chat. Um, it's a really great book um, on these very similar concepts. Um, D Doug Talamy, and it's a blue cover, and it's like, oh gosh, is there anybody out there in the audience who knows what book I'm talking about? I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Oh, in the chat. Oh, I, but Renee, I, I, I think that so you're sad that I just don't know the title yeah. off the top of my head. And that's okay, because I think, um, you know, we can, we can follow, uh, you know, uh, emerging, uh, you know, as I'll say stars in, in this field. Oh, nature's best hope. Thank you. Nature's best yeah, hope. Nature's yes. Best. Read that book. Um, again, there, there is, I have found some differing opinions on that book, you know, coming out of Cal Poly, um, Cal Poly Slow, there's a professor there who debates uh, he doesn't, well, okay, he made a statement like he doesn't care about the insects and that we need to just change, be, we need to change because the climate's changing, we need to just find the best suited plants, um, doesn't matter where they come from, was some of the statements that I read, so there is differing opinions, yes, I'm, I'm not going to say that there's not, and that's why I'm constantly reading to really understand what's true and what's not true. Um, but I think trying to read the most up-to-date research and developments that's coming out there, because this is, people are very passionate about this. They're wanting to try and figure figure out how to restore biodiversity. And this is, again, globally. So unfortunately, I wish I had a really easy recommendation for what to read, but you just have to get out there and just follow hashtags and read, read, read. And don't just, 
listen to the same old things you hear from people. Like you will, you will hear tag phrases and that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's all not a hundred percent. Um, but I think also instinctually, some things just make sense in your gut. I'm a scientist, but there are a lot of things that just make sense in my gut. Um, so that's why I try and bring these pictures to you of like, this is what soil looks like when it's been damaged. This is what yeah. plastic, oh, looks fantastic plastic the plastic you think is being recycled. It's not, it's getting dumped in our oceans. Single use plastic, we have to just stop using it. Forget about recycling it. You might as well just throw it in the trash. Don't, it, it's not about repurposing the plastic. It's about not using it. And where do our, do our dollars go? Wherever our dollars go is what industry will support. Think about um, organic food. You know, five years ago, it was hard to find organic food on the shelves. Now you can find it everywhere. Yeah. So our dollar matters. Even when you think it doesn't, it does. It matters. Absolutely. Change starts right here. It starts in the mirror. Well, Renee, I'm going to stop the presentation. I'm going to thank you and thank everybody for attending tonight. We are after eight o'clock and Renee, thank you again so much for your presentation to the Sacramento Valley chapter of CNPS. Again, everybody, correction, plant sale is on Saturday, September 16th at the, the nursery. Thank you again, Renee, and good night, everyone. And thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Renee. Okay, I'm gonna receive an email when the cloud